Good morning everyone. I'm Tracy Noah from the Marion Library Service and welcome to our Library Through the Lens live webinar. I acknowledge today that I am on Ghana land and recognise the Ghana people as the traditional and continuing custodians of the land. Since the closure of our libraries and venues, we've been working hard to still connect and engage with you through our Library Through the Lens series of adult programs delivered differently. We had to reimagine how to bring you the author talks that you've grown to expect from us, so thank you for joining us today. This morning, we meet special guest, Dr. Rob Morrison, scientist, author, and former co-host of the beloved Curiosity Show in conversation with the glorious Joe Case from Wakefield Press. Rob will take us behind the scenes and science in his memoir, Curious Collections. Please feel free at any time during the presentation to type questions you have for Rob into the chat feed on your screen, and he will answer these at the end of his talk. Now sit back, grab a cuppa, and please welcome Rob. Everyone. Hello, Rob. Hello. <laughs> it's lovely to be chatting to you this morning on this winter's morning um, about your book, Curious Recollections, which I'll just hold up for everyone to see. Um, Rob, I thought we would start our chat at the start of things. Um, so you've got your start on television in a fairly unlikely and almost accidental way um, from reading the book. Um, you were a guest on the Humphrey Bee Bear show um, to talk about raising a baby possum, which you write that you had on you at all times, which I thought was quite a gorgeous um, image. Um, can you talk a bit about this first TV experience and how that led on to the Curiosity Show? Yeah, sure. First of all, can you hear me all right? The sound can be a bit, a bit echoey on this thing. So yeah. am I coming over audibly? Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, yes, I, um, uh, Adelaide used to be, for some reason, the kind of headquarters of children's television. This was before Curiosity Show or anything. A lot of it was done on the ABC. And mm -hmm. I used to be involved there on radio and television. And the television show, I forget what it was called. But um, anyway, we were doing a, a segment there. And I used to hand rear with my wife little marsupials, little foundlings. And I had a beautiful little possum. Uh, he was, I, I made a shoulder holster for him. It was a sock, which <laughs> ran over a ring of wire, if you can imagine that, and on a couple of strings. And you could put it over your shoulder under your jacket. And um, you needed to do this because they need a lot, of, a lot of feeds. And it would just sit there quietly until you know, it was hungry. Then it would stir and you'd feel it, so you'd feed it. So it was with me all the time. It was known as Bagley because of this peculiar kind of holster it was in. But anyway, I, uh, working with the ABC it was a fairly leisurely business. You'd, you'd, uh, you'd come in and you'd talk through your segment and they'd set the lights and you'd have a cup of tea and then you'd talk through the segment again and um, have another cup of tea and rearrange things and discuss how it might happen, have a cup of tea and you know, talk it through a bit more, break for lunch, come back, have a rehearsal, not like it, do a take, not like it, do another one. You go home, you would have done a segment and feel you'd worked hard. <laughs> but um, a friend of mine who was working on Channel 9, on, uh, she was Judy Lott, and uh, she was a producer for Here's Humphrey. And she knew about this little possum and said, would I come on Here's Humphrey and, and show it to the children? And I said, sure. <laughs> so I went into Channel 9. I knew all about this television business. So I went in and I sat on a stool and the hostess, who was uh, Patsy Bisco, came out and, and sat down and asked me about the possum, which I produced and did my little first talk. And then she went off somewhere, so I, I sat there waiting to do the next talk and wondering if a cup of tea was going to come. And she came <laughs> up and said, uh, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm waiting to do the segment. She said, we've done it. Go, I've got to get on. So I slunk off feeling like an idiot, um, but got a phone call uh, the next day from Ian Fairweather, who was producing this new program, saying, uh, did, they, did I know they were doing this new program? And I had no idea. I said, no. And they, he said, do you know we're looking for a presenter? I said, no. He said, I couldn't help noticing how relaxed you were on camera. I at least had the wit not to tell him that I didn't know I was being filmed. I thought it was about two hours away from a take. So I shut up about that. They offered me the job and I took it. I wasn't so relaxed when I started, but I was in by then, so it was okay. So Bagley did me a good, uh, a good bit of uh, good deed. 
Oh, that, that's a fantastic story about an accidental start. And I love the idea that you were so relaxed because you thought you were rehearsing. Um, so I, I wonder, uh, so Patsy Disco was the, uh, um, your first encounter um, and Here's Humphrey was the beginning of uh, you going on to the Curiosity Show, but also the Curiosity Show started as a segment of Here's Humphrey, didn't it? Well, yes, I mean, when the whole thing started because the Children's Program Committee, which is a, a federal body under the wonderful Dr. Patricia Edgar, came up with regulations that were enforced throughout commercial television that suddenly told them that they would from now on start making programs for school going children, because all they made was before that was preschoolers, and it was up to them whether they made that or not. But they would have to start making programs for children of school going age and show them in out of school hours. And that was the Magic C program. You had to get a, you had to qualify, you had to, you know, get approved for your, your show. And so the channel had no idea what they were going to do about this. They, they hadn't thought about this at all and it was being foisted on them. And for many years, this is not a nice story, but my rundowns for Curiosity Show, which are now in the State Library, they headed the F program because that's what the <laughs> channel heavies said when they found they had to make this program. So the F program was born and they didn't know what to do. So all they did was to get Humphrey, who was designed for three year olds, to take on board this mad sort of scientist to do stuff for 10 year olds. So Curiosity Show had about four different starts and one of them was a kind of offshoot of Humphrey Bear. Bear. It was called Humphrey B. Bear's Curiosity Show. It was terrible. You know, it's just <laughs> awful. And Humphrey didn't want us there and he kept trying to upstage us because, you know, he was worried about losing his audience and didn't want this person interfering with his program. It was ghastly. So eventually, <laughs> Dean and I managed to spin it off as our own show. But the beginning was anything but harmonious. <laughs> <laughs> you, you actually tell a wonderful story that I feel you're leading up to quite nicely here about an encounter with Humphrey that starts the book, um, the time that you got, you got Humphrey to uh, speak, not only speak on television, but swear on television. Oh, I wonder if you can tell us not, that story. Yeah, it's not a nice story at all, but um, <laughs> yes, it was in those early days when we had to deal with Humphrey. And as I said, he was always trying to, uh, he'd get behind you when, you when you couldn't see and do a lot of, because he couldn't talk, there's a lot of gesticulating and <laughs> distracting and, sometimes interfering with your segment. But uh, we had an outside broadcast unit, which is pretty rare in those days because it was costly, but it must've been left over from something. And so we, we were offered it. We thought, what can we do with it? So I said, well, let's take it out to my laboratory in the university and I'll dress it up with machines and things and make it look good, which I did. And one of them was a Van de Graaff generator. And these things, if, if you've met them, you see them in science museums, they, they generate about, you know, 500,000 volts and make your hair stand on end with static electricity. So this had been grinding away in the background for quite some time. It's a new one. It was a good one. And anyway, Humphrey, I was doing some segment. I can't remember what it was on. And Humphrey was in the background doing a lot of pointing and gesticulating and trying to distract my audience. And he was getting closer and closer to this machine. And I thought, well, this will be fun. Because you don't want to point at a Van de Graaff generator too closely, which he did. And there was a crack like a rifle shot and, a, and an arc of blue fire, I'll swear, about a metre long, leapt from this machine into his outstretched finger. He did a quick 360 and you just heard from the depths of this huge woolly suit. <laughs> I think was the only word he's ever said on television and deeply inappropriate, but I'm responsible for it and feel quite proud these days. <laughs> oh, it, re it really is a fantastic story. It may not be nice, but it is fantastic. So thank you, Rob. <laughs> and I have to say, here at Wakefield Press, as someone who grew up with the Curiosity Show, one of those people who kind of walk walks around after I hear the, the name with the, the little theme tune in my head, um, I read that, that story and I was immediately hooked on your book. It's so funny. Um, <laughs> um, uh -huh. <laughs> the Humphrey suit was, it was a, it was a, it was a very good design. It was actually designed by Rex Heading, who went on to be the general manager. 
but it was very well designed for three-year-olds, but it was a nightmare to wear. I've only been inside the head, and that was enough. <laughs> it's, a huge, it's a huge padded thing in three parts. And, of course, the trouble was Humphrey used to have to do promotional things outside, and they were the several suits, and um, they'd get different people to be presenting in a shopping centre while the other Humphrey was recording on air. But, of course, in a heat wave, the, the actor inside would sweat like a pig. And this thing, you couldn't wash it. You couldn't dry clean it. So um, they used to just try and air it and, and, and blow dry it and put it out on the sun to dry. And they had this, it was three parts. It was a head, a sort of jacket, and the, the bottom part was like a pair of overalls, all big and furry. They used to spread this thing out in the sun on various things. One day, a party of school children was visiting Channel 9, and one of them looked out the window and saw this dismembered Humphrey all over the yard. Then he had hysterics, thought Humphrey had fallen off the roof and gone bang all over the place. Not a very educational visit. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you again. Another terrific Humphrey story. <laughs> um, yeah. There's lots of entertaining stories from inside the television studio. Um, and in fact, before I move on to wanting to ask you about something else in the book, um, there, there's another great stunt or kind of trick that you play uh, on someone on the, uh, the, the set of Curiosity Show that results in uh, a bit of an explosion. Um, can you tell us about the uh, crew member who was always annoying you by smoking oh, and yeah. how you revenge on him? Well, that was, I mean, it wouldn't happen now, but back in those days, remember, we made the show between 1972 and 1990. So mm -hmm. everyone smoked all over the place and it would drive you mad in script writers meetings. I mean, we didn't have a script, but you have a production meeting. It'd be somebody smoking in your face and, and I've never smoked and I get hay fever. So, you you know, you'd, and when you're going on air, you don't want a face full of smoke because it makes you talk like that, which is the last <laughs> thing you need. Anyway, we had a floor manager and he used to smoke incessantly on the set. And I would ask him not to and he'd said it was his right to smoke and then puff another face full at you. It drove me nutty, but I was doing a segment one day. I've just actually put it up on YouTube, this very segment. <laughs> and it, it was a segment I designed called Curio. And we would, we would find an odd thing. It was a very good segment for showing children antique... Uh, technology because you could produce this weird thing and you know the camera would show it and and you'd give a few clues about it and say what do you think it is and the curio header would roll with a bit of t a tune and you'd explain it and that would take about a minute and you'd covered something and i'm a pistol shooter i have been for a long time and and have some black powder equipment and black powder is full of these weird instruments that used to be mainstream but nobody knows what they are now, you know, things for putting the percussion cap on the gun and, and cleaning rods and things. And this was a device, uh, it's a bit hard to explain, but if I can show you, there's a sort of rod like that. If you imagine it's about that length and has a corkscrew poking out there and a handle here. And I held this, you know, this was shown and you said, what do you think it is? And it's actually the thing you use when, a, when your muzzle loader didn't go off, you pushed this down the barrel, screwed the screw into the lead ball, which is soft, and then pulled it out. You could uh, start again. So anyway, this bloke was smoking, and I, I got sick of it. And I found in this bag a bit of black powder, which is like gunpowder. And that looks almost exactly like the sort of black ash in an ashtray. <laughs> so I thought, well, we'll have this bloke. And while his back was turned, and he was doing something else. I got a fairly liberal dose of this and pushed it into the ashtray amongst all these ash and cigarette butts. And I forgot about it. I was getting ready for my next segment and he lit up another one. And when he came to stub this out in the ashtray, it was behind my back. The first I knew of it was this sort of, sounded like whoom! And I turned around and there's a smoke ring like a tractor tire just descending up into the, into the roof of this studio. Of course, the whole thing had lit off and gone off like a mortar. And... Uh, I thought I was going to be for it because the stage manager used to have to log um, incidents, as they were called. 
and I thought I'd be logged and called to account. But he must have realised I would have a pretty good defence about saying he wouldn't stop smoking. So I never heard any more about it. But he never smoked near me again. It was uh, it was effective. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, <laughs> uh, they they sound even better when you tell them. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> I another thing that I found really fascinating about the book was um, something that I was really surprised to find in there, and that was your story about being called in as an expert witness, a dingo expert, um, in the infamous Lindy Chamberlain trial. And I wonder if you could tell us about your role in that trial and how it came about. Right, yes, it was, um, it was an interesting time for me, terrible for the Chamberlains, but the there'll be some people watching perhaps who don't know about the Chamberlain trial, but it's probably one of the most if not the most famous set of criminal trials in Australian uh, legal history. And it came about because the Chamberlains were a young couple and they had this little baby, uh, Azaria, and they'd gone for a holiday camping at Ayers Rock. And uh, the, the case erupted because uh, Lindy, uh, out on the camping ground one day, went to check in, in her tent, was to check on the baby, and uh, came out screaming, a dingo's got my baby. So um, there was this big case about the dingo, and then um, through various events which changed, she was then accused of murdering this child, and her husband was accused of being a, a, an accessory. Anyway, there were several trials, and I got involved in the third one, um, Lindy always insisted that the Azaria, when she was put down to bed, had a matinee jacket. And when they found the clothes of this unfortunate child all bloodied and, and chopped up, um, uh, some people said, well, you know, the dingo had done it. And others said, no, no, she did it. And these, you know, where's the matinee jacket? And uh, the lack of the matinee jacket counted against her until uh, an English tourist climbing the rock, as you could then do, fell to his death. It was some days before they found him. They searched around the rock. When they did, they found him near a dingo den and there was the matinee jacket. So it opened the whole thing up again. And at that stage, uh, as usual, there was the prosecution against the Chamberlains and the defense for them. But they had a tribunal. This is the Morling Tribunal. And that was independent. <clears throat> and they called me in because I'd done a book on uh, the identification of tracks and traces of Australian animals. And uh, only a few months before Azari disappeared, I was up at the rock. We filmed a segment for Curiosity Show with Dingo Den. And I also collected dingo tracks. And uh, one of them was the track of what turned out to be probably the, the culprit. And this is big dingo there, well known, quite tame. And I got his footprints and cast them in plaster and photographed them and did the segment. So when they found I'd done a field guide, I was asked to come in and, and join this third trial because in the first two trials, the Aborigines asked to explain how they knew a dingo track from a dog track had given diametrically opposite explanations. And I was asked if I could clarify this. So I was, I was put to the job. They took in the Curiosity Show segment. They took in my plaster cast. Uh, and I was then given the task of doing some forensic work and because an English odontologist had said that dingoes couldn't open their jaws oh. 10 centimetres to take in a baby's head. Well, English dingoes may not be able to, but I tell you, ours can. I, and I, I did some forensic work and showed they could easily do 13, and that's a little dingo. And I uh, did some work on plaster casts of dingo tracks and dog tracks and so it was a very interesting time for me. Um, but I ended up, after I'd given my, uh, my evidence, being taken back by the Chamberlains to have coffee while I waited for my plane. And there were four of us, the Chamberlains, me and their red friend. And that was a very interesting afternoon. And um, as I left, uh, I apologized to them because in, in this case, you know, you've got to sit in a courtroom and the parents are there and you're being asked to discuss how dingoes would have torn their child apart and disemboweled it and removed it. Oh, it's the most ghastly thing to talk about in front of parents. But yeah. you have to. Anyway, I apologise to Michael on the way out for talking about his child in this way. He's, he said, I think they must be the saddest words I've ever heard a parent say. Don't give it a second thought. 
we've held it all so much that it now means nothing to us. Imagine having oh. to say that about your baby. But, um, anyway, eventually it all came came right, and and uh, Ling, they were declared innocent. Michael's dead now, but Lindy has maintained an enormous archive of this. She works with the the National Museum of Australia, where all my my material now is held, and mm. she's, she's catalogued all the letters she had, good, bad, and indifferent. She's uh, she's remarkable yeah. in her in her strength of coping with all this. Mm, mm. Well, I mean, there's a line in the book that you um, where you describe an exchange you had with Lindy that I found really heartbreaking as well. And just like I, I remember, I mean, it's one, one of my first memories of the coverage of that trial. Um, and you said to her, um, noticing her friendly manner, you asked her why all her photos were so dour and oh, yeah. smiling. Yeah. And do you remember what she said to you? <laughs> yes. Well. well uh... I mean, in private, she was the most funny, attractive, vivacious woman. A very, very good company. And I said, look, you're very different from those dour, unsmiling, rather grim photographs that we saw in the press at the time. I said, why, why did you come over so sort of bleak? And she said, well, I was told if I smiled, they would think I was heartless. So I didn't smile and they thought I was heartless. Yeah. It's true. I mean, at that stage, everyone thought she'd done it. All the press thought she'd done it. Uh, she could do nothing that was going to change, change that picture until the evidence started to mount up. It was a terrible yeah. case. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, well, um, that's just one of the many stories uh, from all around Australia that uh, you include in the and you include some great stories about travelling Australia and the world with the show. I wonder if you could share what, what are perhaps your most memorable experiences, um, either for good or bad reasons? <laughs> <laughs> it's, I've thought about this. It, it, it's quite hard because, you, you, you know, your, your mind goes back and, and there was 18 years of stuff. So you just get little pictures of things you did. I think, yeah. I think for me... I mean, I'm, I, I like being a tourist, but you go to places like Cuba PD as a tourist, mm. and that's sort of all you are. Whereas if you're mm. filming, you're in behind the scenes. And I, yep. love, I love that aspect of filming. You get in behind the scenes, you, you're sort of part of what makes it, rather than just a spectator of what makes it. Mm. Um, I think staking a claim in, in Cuba PD had its moments, but. I think generally speaking for me, because I'm a zoologist and very interested in animals, some of the animal, animal encounters were pretty good. I mean, I used to be able to get into the Adelaide Zoo. I did a lot of work there. So you get into the enclosures. I never like doing segments through wire or cages. It's, it's horrible. You've got to be with the animal and touching it. You can't do that with lions and things, but you can with <laughs> air eaters and orangutans and, you know, things like that. For me, that's always a joy. Having a crocodile hatch in your hands and holding oh. a newly hatched kiwi and, you know, having a tuatara dangling off your finger, all that's pretty good. So yeah. I think the constant buzz for me was the animal, close animal encounters. Um, but yes, there were some interesting instances. I mean, the spoke, I decided I would do a segment when we went to Cooper PD. Excuse me, just adjusting my, my legs under my desk. Um, I do a segment on staking a claim. Now, it's a bit elaborate. You have to go to the Department of Mines and get your miners permit. And they give you four little cards and you have to put poles in on the corner of your claim and put these little cards on it to say who you are and all that. So we simplified it a little. But uh, the first part of the segment we filmed in Adelaide and I went in, I got these little plates and explained them and off we went. Uh, next bit was in Cooper Pedy, where we drove out under the my, under the sort of miners' field. It's an amazing place if you've never been there. From the air, it looks like a sort of you know a bit of board attacked by by borers. It's just holes and little mounds. It's extraordinary sight. Everything's underground. But we drove out there to a to a little spot we found, and there were miners and you know mullock going everywhere and, and very busy. So he set up the camera and the miners were sort of interested. They're looking over there from their work. 
And the thing is about television, if you, when I can do it here with this camera, if you've got a scene of me here, and if you want another scene, I can just sort of vanish off camera here, we move <laughs> the camera a little bit like that, and I come in from here, and it looks like a different scene. Although I only sort of move the camera 15 degrees, and it's mm. a lot easier to do that than move the entire production crew. Yeah. So I put in my, my first take, and I put the, put the little sign on it, I exited it, and we moved the camera a few degrees, and I came in from the other side, put it in another stake, and completed the whole thing. So when I finished my segment, we got up and left, I mm. had a claim that must have been about the size of a sort of small bathroom, <laughs> about the size of a big grave. These miners had stopped oh. looking. They're looking at this idiot who's pegging. A, a, a plane is meant to be 100 metres by 100 metres. I'd yeah. pegged this thing about the size of a bat. <laughs> you can see them wondering what this idiot from the, the city was doing and why television would be at all interested in this. But I'll bet after I'd gone, my plane didn't remain undigged for very long. They must have thought I was onto something very specific. <laughs> I, never, I never went back. <laughs> One of those things you'll never know the, the end of the yes, story. Yes, yes, <laughs> Great. Um, and you also, uh, another place you write about um, with devoting a full chapter to it is um, visiting Antarctica from the air um, in 1978 for a um, Curiosity Show segment. Um, and yes. that obviously made a big impression on you. No, well, that was an interesting thing. The... Um the jumbo jets had just come and they're all all a buzz you know big things that could fly a long way it said that people who never had a trip on a jumbo were desperate to have one and dick smith is alleged to have set it up in sydney so mm -hmm. that if you really wanted to fly on a jumbo in your lunch hour you could race to the airport with your packed lunch you'd get on a jumbo it would mm -hmm. take off on one runway go around and land on another and you'd then race back to your, your, your desk and continue after lunch. So you'd fly on the jumbo. But these things were starting, they were doing Antarctic flights. Yeah. And most of them left from Melbourne. But the news sponsored one and it left from Adelaide. And yeah. we were offered, uh, in Curiosity Show, we were offered places on this to cover the flight. Yeah. And, and for some reason, I, I didn't really want to. I thought it was just a silly sort of bit of... Uh, you know, a bit of a wank, but I didn't really want to do it. But, um, you know, it gave us the chance of doing some extra segments. So I said we would. So Dean and I and the cameraman and the producer got on this thing. And, uh, uh, I mean, it was, it, it had a few mechanical faults and, and people started to mutter because it was taking a long while to get anywhere. It had to go from Adelaide to Melbourne land and then do this very long flight to Antarctica. Mm. But they, uh, they sensed, the audience was getting a little uh, restive. So, you know, those smooth voices they have, ladies and gentlemen, we're sorry about the, uh, <laughs> the delay, but we'd like to uh, compensate you by making all drinks free on the flight. Wow. They know their <laughs> audience. That was it. Um, so it's a long way down. And the, our pilot was very good. He's a Qantas bloke. And he said, look, if there are any clouds, you won't see anything. I'm not going low. We'll hope for the best, but if they're clouds, we'll just have to come back. But fortunately, it opened up and we, we got some very good shots of Antarctica. It was just magic. I'm so glad I'd come. Yeah. And uh, on the way back, everyone was partying on the free grog and they mm. offered us films. No one wanted them. The, the, the audience was amazing. It was, a, it was a, a plane full of, I think, people over 60 and 10-year-olds. And I mm. wondered about this, but I think it was... The over 60s had grown up on the legend of Mawson and Scott of the Antarctic. And it was a magic sort of, um, you know, explorer stuff. And uh, they wanted their grandchildren to experience this. I think it was that. And also they wanted a flight on a jumbo, but not have to worry about foreign money and customs. <laughs> and they could be back in their bed that night. So it was magic. I put a sign on my door at work, gone to Antarctica, back tomorrow. It was, it was very interesting, but the next flight was the New Zealand one, and, and some somebody had programmed in coordinates, but not called the pilots, and they thought they were going down uh, over the sea, and they actually flew straight into Mount Erebus and killed everybody. 
Wow. So that was the last flight for a very long time. They're on again now. They're going from Melbourne. Mm -hmm. They were well worth doing. They were, and they were wonderful. But we had a very, very cautious pilot. He wasn't going to, he knew some dangers and he wasn't going to get into them. No, it sounds like you took the right flight. Yeah, we did. And yeah. uh, Antarctica is tricky. Little, little planes get into trouble because you can imagine here's the Antarctic shelf. It's very cold. Mm -hmm. And there's a cliff of ice, and the ocean is down there. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the the air is so cold, it rolls across the Antarctic and drops like a stone because it's so cold and dense. If you're in a little plane flying along here, you just mm -hmm. get blown straight down into the sea. So we were in a big plane, but it, it's got its hazards as, a, as an environment for flying. I made a model of this with dry ice, and it shows it pretty well. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, that, that sounds like a Curiosity Show segment. <laughs> well, we got, a, we got a lot of segments out of it, but uh, yeah. <laughs> fortunately didn't end up in Mount Erebus. Yeah. Um, I, you've been, you, you talked before about being a zoologist and really enjoying the segments with the animals. Um, and you've been really heavily involved with um, South Australian zoos, as you say. Um, both as a former president of Adelaide Zoo and um, filming Curiosity Show segments there. Um, and you write in the book that zoos now provide the only feasible solution to saving many animals from, distinction, uh, from extinction. Um, can you talk a bit about that? Yes. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about zoos. I, 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 yes, as I say, I did a lot of work in the zoos mm -hmm. and ended up on the board for 10 years and for six of those I was the president of Zoo South Australia is Adelaide Zoo and Monato. So oh, I was the yeah. president of both. And I distinguish zoos from menageries. Menageries were those gaspy old Victorian things where you just had concrete and cages and the idea was to collect as many animals as you could so they're in small cages in ranks and the more animals you had, the better your zoo. That, that was ghastly. That's a menagerie and they should all be finished with. Um, a zoo, I mean, I mean, in, in those days you collected animals the way you collected them in a museum. It was like a living museum. Mm -hmm. And in those days, the things that controlled them were anatomy. You know, you, one animal you told from another because it had different horns or different antlers. So you needed one of those as well. <laughs> and, and taxonomy, which is classification, the more the better. They're very old sciences. The three sciences that I think are the most important in a modern zoo are all modern. They mm. are genetics, so that you, you know, for example, we had a tiger, we wanted to mate her. The mm. tiger we could find in the world that was least genetically linked to her was in Berlin. We had another tiger, and you get a tiger from anywhere but we had to get the one with the most dissimilar genetics. So you have to pay a fortune to get this tiger and then they didn't like each other. They weren't going to make. So genetics controls making sure you don't get inbred animals. Try to keep the genetic diversity going. The second one is animal behavior. That ethology is a recent science. And so enclosures now are designed to maximize the animal's natural habitat you make sure that you don't just plonk food in a dish. You hide it for bears, so they have to cross it the way they do in life. <clears throat> we even do this for our chooks, you know, you scatter wheat so they scratch for it rather than just put it in a bowl. Yeah. Uh, what's the other one? Um, I think it, 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 ecology is the other, the relationship of animals and plants. So we now use the plants of an animal's native country where you can in the in the in the enclosure. You try and combine animals. So we've got langurs and tapirs together. They don't hurt each other, but they live together in the wild. So you have that. So now you're trying to create really hospitable, excellent kind of enclosures for the animals. Yeah. And you can tell if it's working because they breed. I mean, Adelaide Zoo's record in breeding otters is extraordinary. Meerkats, they, they pop them out all the time. When it's working, that's good. But um, sadly, uh, I think for things like tigers, I don't think they're a good zoo animal, actually. Um, mm -hmm. But if you don't have them in modern zoos, you're not going to have them. Because it used to be 
that if you said this animal could go extinct, you got heaps of money to try and save it. Now, unfortunately, because of Chinese medicine and other kind of ghastly exploitative uh, procedures, to say something is close to extinction means that you quadruple, quintuple its value on the black market. Oh. Rhinoceros horn now, because it's deemed to be an aphrodisiac, it's bloody nonsense. It's no more an aphrodisiac than a horse's hoof, it's modified hair, but it's worth more than gold, for weight for weight. So anybody who can now poach a rhinoceros and hack the horn off is going to make a fortune. And if you yeah. say, for example, tigers are rare, well, in Chinese medicine, they use tiger bone. God knows why, it's meant to give you strength. It doesn't. But the poachers will now try to kill a tiger because they can retire on the proceeds. So zoos have now become, particularly for the rarest animals, the only refuge. It, it's, a, it's an appalling situation. The wildlife, illegal wildlife trade in, in animals is one of the big three, armaments, drugs, and wildlife. And some people reckon that wildlife is bigger than the other two put together. It's, it's wow. an absolutely appalling trade in, in uh, rare animals. It's conspicuous consumption. The rarer they are, the more valuable they are, and the more risks you can take to get them. Wow. Oh, well, that's, really, that's a really interesting perspective um, on, on modern zoos. So, oh, yeah. Also, Thank I should add, we do a lot of research. I think when I was president, we, were, we had about 48 research programs in Australia and internationally, things like orangs. We would support that because you can really do research to find out what you need to protect the animals in their habitat. You know, how much range an animal needs. I mean, for example, the, the orangutans are a, a huge problem because people are filling their forests in Borneo to put in um, palms. Now you yeah. can rear, as they're doing, uh, we support this, they're rearing the little um, foundlings. A lot of them, a lot of people kill the mother to get the, the baby, because they can sell the baby into the black market on the pet trade. So you get these foundlings, which are reared. But then if you put them out in the wild, you've got a problem, because a male orangutan is huge. They're solitary animals. And to feed him, he needs a big space. So if they're mm. females put into that space, and it's a decreasing space, he will clean them out, you know, just take all their food. So you have to be very careful that you've got enough space to put them into. We have the same problem with possums. Trap a possum in your roof, let it go in the wild, it'll be beaten up by the possums already living there. So you need a lot of research on what these animals need just to make their sanctuaries work. It's not a matter of just putting them in the wild and hoping for the best. Yeah, so zoos are about, um, about prep preservation of the species, but also about research that enables preservation of species. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Uh, and I mean, for example, uh, there, there's a black flank rock wallaby, very rare, very rare in, in uh, Australia. <clears throat> so you want to try and have more of these. And our vet at the time, Dave Schultz, um, worked out, uh, well, marsupials have a peculiar kind of, of reproduction. They'll they'll bring a baby on, it's like a peanut, and it will, it will come in, into the pouch, and they have others suspended. And while the one in the pouch is growing and taking milk and getting bigger, the suspended one doesn't develop. As soon as the baby, the big one leaves, the, the suspended one comes on. So Schultz, he realized that you could actually um, take, take a black plank wallaby out, get it fostered by a yellow-footed rock wallaby, and the black one wouldn't even notice that it had gone, would bring on another. And then you can take that out and foster it and bring on another. So these are very happy yeah. animals. It's not like a human losing a baby that's developed all full term. So you have this production line, a very good bit of research, which has greatly increased the number of these very rare animals with no, um, no uh, ill effects to any animal at all. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, I guess, I mean, listening to you talk about all of these, obviously there's a lot more factors than we realise. Like it's a lot more complicated than you realise when you're dealing with, um, with, well, with, with animals because of all the interrelationships in there. Yes, so, yes yeah. they're very, zoos are, 
they're no longer menageries. They're absolutely essential elements in the conservation of rare animals. Yeah, right. Um, before I turn over to um, people's questions, which I can see they're already asked them, um, I, I, this chat is not complete without um, talking about Dean, I think. So, so can just, you... just breaking up a bit there, just say that again. Oh, uh, this chat is not complete without talking about Dean. Can we talk about how, how you and Dean came together on the Curiosity Show and your working relationship? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, now, Dean's uh, a good friend of mine. We still work together, of course, putting the show online and doing uh, public shows. He just had a bad accident, actually, and ended up in hospital, but he's home now, recuperating. Mm -hmm. But um, we sort of knew each other. Of course, we were both lecturers in tertiary institutions. We had come across each other. Um, but he was in America when I was taken on to the show. And then I got a Churchill Fellowship and I left and spent a year in, in Europe, in, in Britain, and Edinburgh. And when uh, I came back, I was offered the position again and, and then he came back and, and so they had two of us instead of one. Ah. And so that's when our working relationship started. Mm. And he, he, he buzzed off to America for a spell a bit later when I was holding the fort. And this was in the days when Curiosity Show was an hour long and had several presenters. And I grew uh, very unhappy with it because, I mean, you, you can't make a magazine program for adults that satisfies mm -hmm. everybody. And people's interests are different. So try and make something that suits everybody. It's not going to work. Well, children have different mm -hmm. interests. They also have different ages. So mm -hmm. a magazine program, all things to all people, is never going to work for children either. So I didn't like it and I was going to leave it. And Dean said, wait till I get back and, and we'll see what we can do. So I did. And we put to the management that we thought we should split Curiosity Show and, and Dean and I could do a science and technology half hour. The other mm -hmm. presenters could go on to, I think, Channel Niners, which was much more a kind of magazine um, entertainment show. And to yes. our amazement, they, they agreed. And so we had mm -hmm. the half hour Curiosity Show with the same resources as the one hour had had. So that oh, made right. it actually quite good in children's television terms. It's never been wonderfully paid for resources, but we had, we had enough to do what we needed to. Mm. And so that was the start, fortunately, of the show that people remember. The, the hour long, I don't think we've got any copies of that and, and we don't want to, you know. <laughs> that was teething times. <laughs> So we've worked together ever since. Wow. Yeah, and that's amazing that you got you two have continued to work together. I mean, long since the Curiosity Show ended, you still travel around and, and do presentations together. You work together on putting the Curiosity Show onto YouTube. Um, why do you think that is? Is it just you enjoy working together so much you've never stopped? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, I mean, I, I probably see more of Dean now when we go into state than we do here. I mean, he lives a long way from me. We talk a lot on the phone and we have to work on this program, but um, we don't live in each other's pocket, but it's always good to see him. I think it worked because both of us, I mean, the timing of Curiosity Show, we were very lucky. Yeah. It, it started in 72. And um, so both of us had grown up without television. Yes. Uh, kids today don't quite, I can't quite imagine what life was like when you didn't have television or, or video. But you made your own fun. You, you made things. You, you, you made and did things. And um, we sort of brought that into the show. Uh, I, I can't stress how important I think it is for children to learn how to make and do things that work. Uh, yeah. I, I can't empirically show this but you just see its effect everywhere. The child who can, who's got confidence in the fingers to be able to do and repair and make. And people used to come up to me in the show and they say, oh, you're so lucky to be able to use your hands. And you look down expecting bloodied stumps. They have perfectly good hands. They didn't have the confidence. You know, you, yeah. if you've made and done things all your life as a child, uh, mm -hmm. then you've got a, a lot of fantastic skills 
it's like learning grammar or learning your times table. You don't realize if you haven't got them, how much they can underlie what you can then do. Farm kids have this because they have to, they have to make things out of wire and they have this ability. So we also wanted to try and put on a lot of stuff in the show, which children would find interesting enough to try and make and do. Yeah. And um, I know when I was a kid, you'd have these things in a book, which would say, make this aeroplane that flies out of matchboxes. Mm -hmm. I can remember that very thing. And I made this and it dropped like a stone. And I thought it was me. You know, I, th I thought I'm no good at this. And uh, I realized now it could never have flown. It was you know, designed by some drunk on a Friday afternoon. It was never going to work. But at the time I thought it was me. So mm. I said to Dean, I think whenever we make and do stuff, we should show ours working. Mm. A, because kids will know that if they get it right, it will work. But they can also see the limitations. So when they make a, a, a glider with a rubber band and think it will fly around the room for hours. Well, it won't. It'll sort of go brrrr. And that's about <laughs> all we could do. So you'd show yeah. it doing that, and then you'd know, A, it would work if you got it right, and B, that was the limitation of what we could do. So you, you, know, you didn't encourage a false expectation for which the child will then blame themselves if it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really interesting. And I think one of the things that was always so great about it was that it took household items... Um, I mean, things you might go out and find, but also a lot of things you can find around the house. And like you say, just really showed step by step how you might do it yourself. It made, it made science and making things feel really accessible. Well, thank so, you for that. But that was deliberate. I mean, if, you, if you're watching the show in, in Oruru on a Sunday afternoon and somebody says, go out to your hobby shop and get some balsa and a little electric motor, you, you're done. You haven't got a hobby shop. You can't do that. You haven't got the money. So we would yeah. just say you're making a glider. You, you, you might make the prototype at home out of balsa. But when you mm -hmm. made it work, you'd think, right, what can I substitute? So you take the balsa out and make an old foam meat tray. That works. A foam, kit, foam roofing tiles or bits of old foam packaging. You can cut that and make that work instead. You use mm -hmm. wire instead of some elaborate device. You try and break it down to use everyday stuff. We're, now we're online, we get some stick about this because one of my segments, it's got about five million hits. It's the one actually on the cover of, on the, cover of uh, the book. You see us yeah. using a, um, a sort of isochronous curve there. Well, to, the isochronous curve is the, is the curve that a reflector on a, on a bike wheel makes when it goes down, stops, up, down, stops, up. And it's got peculiar properties. The way you can make one is to get a tin with a rubber band around it, put a pencil in it and roll it so it makes this mark on a bit of card. Well, a bit of card ah. used was an old Dr. Pat tobacco tin. All these yeah. Americans say, oh, he's using a tobacco tin. Oh, he's using a, you know, completely <laughs> disproportionate. You, you grab whatever was at hand and a rusty tin in that segment was for me exactly what you should use. Because that's yeah. what you'll find if you go out to the shed. So it, it, yeah. it's, um, it's important to try and use the, you know, the stuff that you throw away, toilet roll, tubes, and old, I mean, these are, these are, I've got a collection of Japanese bamboo chopsticks. Every time I go to the yeah. Japanese restaurant, these come home with me. They're extraordinarily useful for all sorts of things. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I think every household with kids especially should have a making things box of bits yeah, of junk. Yeah. Or a shed, or a shed. Yeah, or a shed, or a shed. <laughs> um, so, Tracy, do we have uh, any questions for Rob? Hi, Joe and Rob. Yes, we do have a few, but while we're on the subject of Dean and making, um, Rob, would you ever team up again with Dean to do a curiosity comeback show and bring back that art of making and doing and imagination for children again? Oh, in a, in a heartbeat. In fact, we did. <laughs> we, we were engaged by Kellogg's to do a curiosity show. I don't do commercials, Dean's done a few, but I, I find doing commercials doesn't sit easily with teaching. I mean, te teachers don't like it if you sell your words. So I've, I've never done that. So I said we wouldn't do any promotions in it, but we're quite happy to do a curiosity show about, you know, grain and carbohydrates and, you know, chemicals of the body and all that. 
you know, the curio, the curio and that, the odd implement was a scythe. I've, I've got one in the shed. So that sort of stuff. So we did that and that's online somewhere. Um, we do live shows, which are sort of, you know, science alive, although it's been knocked off by COVID this year. So we do stuff like that on, on stage. The trouble is people say, oh, which, you know, why don't you bring it back? Well, when you think about it, it came into existence because the law said to commercial channels, you will make stuff and it will be on in a specific hour. Uh, the expectation was A, that parents would monitor what you watch and, and allow or disallow it. You could only do it on television. It would only be on at certain times of the day. Now kids watch whatever they like on their phones anyway. So the whole notion of a C, you know, children's time is really gone. So without that, I think you wouldn't have really had a curiosity show and you, you, you couldn't easily do it now. Anyway, there's, there's no money left. All the advertising that sustained commercial channels has gone onto the internet. And yeah. now they're struggling for money. So it's, it's cheap stuff like game shows. They're cheap mm -hmm. to make. Uh, so, you know, the golden era of television was meant, was said to be the 70s and 80s. We were very lucky. We just hit it exactly right. That luck, <laughs> just luck. So, I, you know, I don't think anyone will ask us, but if they did, we'll be there. <laughs> Good to know. Anyone out there listening? <laughs> and Joe and I will be there, won't we, Joe? Because it was one when we were young, not giving away our ages or anything. <laughs> oh, I'm very <hurrying. laughs> All right, I'll just get to some of these questions from our listeners. So, um, it says here, Rob mentioned Antart uh, Antarctica, sorry, and it reminded um, me of a book I recently read. So for Rob, have you read Terror by Dan Simmons? It's about the Franklin Northwest Passage Ex Expedition. No, but I want to. That's a fascinating story. Poor old Franklin was a very unlucky bloke. Um, and and the, the, I don't know what this book covers, but the archaeology, which has tried to trace this lost, only two ships went up there and vanished. No one knew, knew what had happened to them. They've, they've now found one. They've actually dived and found one. Um, but it was a terrible tale. Uh, the traces they found, the crews had left these ships and they'd dragged a boat across the ice carrying things like writing desks, most peculiar. And it seems to be that what they, I hope I'm not spoiling the book for anyone, but it's a very interesting tale. Um, it was the, one of the first, if not the first expedition where they provisioned it with canned food. And the cans mm -hmm. they used probably for cheapness, um, had lead soldering. And so these poor blokes on these ships were steadily getting lead poisoning, which has terrible effects. And so, you know, by the time that Franklin died, um, the time they got up, they were nuts. And they resorted to cannibalism. It was just the most ghastly thing. But the archaeology of it these days is really interesting. I love to I love to read the book. <laughs> but there's a book recommendation for you, Rob. Mm, mm. And I'm sure you can get that one in the libraries. <laughs> what's, um, the name, what's the name again? Let's have a look. Sorry. Oh. Terror by Dan Simmons. Simons. Okay. Terror as in fear, terror. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, what else have we got here from our curious people? You've mentioned the zoo, but what have you been doing with yourself since the end of the film in the Curiosity Show? Oh, well, um, yeah, good question. Well, some people would remember the old Investigator Science and Technology Centre. Dean and I were ticket holders, number one, but that folded some years ago. They, they just, it was too small a premise and they, they, they couldn't make it work. So three of us decided that we didn't want to see the end of interactive science in South Australia. So we bought the assets and formed SciWorld which a number of people might have come across. And SciWorld doesn't have a building, but we're mobile. We're mobile science education. And so for about 13 years now, we've been trotting around the countryside, taking interactive science, like the old explainers and the investigators, taking out to schools, doing shows in Science Alive. So I was chair of that for the inaugural chair for about 11 years, I think, and I'm now deputy chair. Um, mm -hmm. The zoo came along, being president of that. That was post-Curiosity Show. 
quite a lot of science uh, as a nature foundation for 24 years as a counselor. And I got back into music a bit. I've always been a, a trumpet player and I play jazz. So I've got about three jazz bands I'm in. They're all suspended with COVID, of course, but we hope we'll get going again soon. Um, and jewelry, I, I do silver work and silver jewelry. So, you know, you keep yourself busy. You have things to do. <laughs> Lucky enough say, to have a childhood where I learned to use them. <laughs> I can say as Rob's publisher that he always seems very busy. Whenever we talk to him and say, what have you been up to? Or, you know, when, uh, when are you free? There's like a, a, a full diary of things. So. <laughs> well, actually, one of the place we, my wife is an expert uh, um, textile artist. So we both exhibit in the Marion Gallery, Gallery M. That's a fabulous gallery there. One of the best galleries in, in South Australia. Beautiful lighting, very good, terrific people. So that's well worth a visit down there. Once, right. once it, it is an amazing gallery. They've got some yeah. gorgeous local art in there. And an excellent shop. Yeah, what, what gifts. That's a beautiful shop there. It certainly is. And um, SciWorld is an amazing company. We have actually had them visit the libraries as well. Yes, I think you had them on not long ago. Okay, so we have a question here. You've spoken about how children should learn to use their hands and develop those physical skills. What other skills would you recommend children nowadays learn? Oh, um, well, I, I think, I mean, one of the, when I left being president of the zoo, I think almost my favourite section was the children's zoo because you could see children coming in who had no fault of their own, you know, they lived in flats and so renting a flat, they weren't allowed to have pets or they lived on a high rise, you couldn't have a pet or, you know, mum and dad worked, you couldn't have a pet. But you see these children coming in and they're the tame llamas and little chickens and you could see them touching living animal for the first time. And the magic of that, holding a little day old chicken in their hands you have to be careful because they didn't know how to hold it but the magic of it to them you could see so for me children need to grow up with animals um if if they don't they tend to think of humans and animals as different things whereas they're on the same continuum you need to know that you and animals are part of the same thing they have the proper appreciation of them and liking for them and care for them and that's essential. I mean, we try to get people interested in conservation of the natural world. You'll never conserve what you don't care about. Uh, if you can get a child caring about animals, then they'll, they'll worry about how to look after animals. So for me, having intimate connection as a child with animal life is a really big one. Not always easy, but I think children's zoos and petting zoos and some of these do offer something of it. I think that's, that's essential. I, I think I was never good as a math student and I know how much I missed in life because of that. But we did always try in Curiosity Show to have some of these funny little number puzzles which were engaging without needing to know much maths. And I think if I was a teacher of maths in primary school, I'd probably start each lesson with one of these to try and get kids to like numbers in the same way, rather than this very quickly inbuilt fear of not being able to do it. And the, once the shutters come down, they're very hard to raise. You know, mm. I think some of these things, love of, love of reading, that's essential. I'm, a, I'm an ambassador for um, Raising Literacy Australia. And that's a crucial thing. To, I watch people now who have no books in their house. And I think, what do they do? Well, we have too many books, but not to no, be so able to read for pleasure. To, to not know what to do with yourself unless there's a television. I mean, you can see the despair now in these COVID times when people are thrown on their own resources and they, they, they don't read for pleasure. I don't know what they do. So all of these things are really important and they happen in these primary years. And so that's, that's all, uh, you've got to put it all in there. I think I had a really good science te um, arts teacher at school. It's a fellow called Charles Bannon. He was the father of our uh, later premier, John Bannon, but he was an artist. But for me, his great strength was he's an art teacher. And he got you to do everything. Uh, I mean, 
before I left primary school, I'd blacksmithed, I'd beaten copper, I'd made marionettes. Uh, they weren't good, but I left. And for the rest of my life, there was something up there that said, I'll go back to that one day because I can do it. If you haven't had that, and someone says, why don't you try making a silver ring? Something up there says, I can't do it because I never have. I haven't got the confidence to do it. You see it in maths a lot. And so I think the more you can give children, even if it's passing phases or crazes, um, the more they'll have up there, I can do that. Even if I don't do it, I could. That's, that's really important. I agree. What? Um, Peter says, hi, Rob, and thank you. I love the Curiosity Show and used to run home from school to watch it every week when I was a young whippersnapper. There was a segment when Dean made a hovercraft using a small engine from Skeletrix cars. Is that segment still around? And if so, could it be posted on YouTube? I'm, I'm pretty certain it is on YouTube. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I don't know how to get the information to you, but I, I'll have a look. Um, I think if you probably, if you typed in to Google curiosity show hovercraft, you should find it. And it was a classic of, of what we're talking about. It did have a little electric motor true, but it was actually made out of a paper plate oh. uh, because that actually makes the skirt. So if you get this thing blowing down, the paper plate acts the skirt, the thing will scoot around very nicely. So I think, I think a search of curiosity show hovercraft might find it. But I'll, I'll have a look for it anyway and, and get a reference. No, you're right. I've just looked on my other screen here. And if you search, uh, yeah, Curiosity Show Hovercraft, it's show number 20. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joan, would, Joan would like to know what the red object in front of your bookcase is just there on the top of your shoulder. Oh, this thing? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I'll get it done. That's actually, that's actually a plastic cornet. I've got a blue one too. Uh, because I'm a trumpet player, um, they're making these things in plastic now and I was sent one for review. And it was this one and I didn't like it much because it had slightly sticky valves. And I complained about that. So they sent me a blue one. So I now have the red and the blue. And uh, then they sent me the later development, which is a plastic trumpet, but it has metal valves, which is extremely good. These are not bad. There are, I think they're ideal for children because you, you really can't bend them. You know, you, you can, I don't know if you can see it there. It's got, the whole thing is plastic, except I'll put a metal mouthpiece in, but it's, it's a plastic valve action and they work. So you could give that to a child to learn on. And you know you can chuck it in the kit bag or drop it on the ground. It's not going to suffer much, and that's their real strength, I think. <laughs> well, there's a great answer. <laughs> it was perfect. And just one last comment. So this is from Marilyn. She said she had a fabulous science teacher at Teachers College, and his name was Rob Morrison. I'm assuming that was you. Well, that's kind. Very kind indeed. <laughs> I wonder what year that was. I don't think she wants to put that one in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I, I started out at it was, it was then Bedford Park Teachers College, which then became Stuart College of Advanced Education, then became the South Australian College, then became Flinders University. So I was in the same office pretty well all that time. But uh, Stuart, Bedford Park and Stuart, were, they were magic places. They were new and and uh, we had a really good crowd of new staff and and students. It was a really vital place. I enjoyed that. Great. Do you have anything else for Rob, Joe? That's the end of our questions from our attendees this morning. Uh, you know, look, I could talk to Rob for another hour about the book, but he's probably got other things to do this afternoon. <laughs> so, you know, another day, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would like to thank people for tuning in. It's very kind of you. And uh, I hope you enjoy the stuff we've got up online. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rob and Joe, for joining us this morning and sharing your fascinating and entertaining stories with us. I mean, it's rather priceless that you made Humphrey swear and that he was so competitive with you. Who would have thought that? 
<laughs> Thanks, Tracy. And you've tainted him in my mind forever. I'm going to rename him Humphrey B.O. Bear after we're <laughs> hearing about his sweaty suit. <laughs> so thank you once again, Rob. Uh, Rob's book, Curious Recollections, can be found uh, online or via phone directly from Wakefield Press. So their phone number is 8352 double four double five and online is at wakefieldpress.com.au yes great so please keep following the marion library's facebook page and city of marion website and check your inbox to be kept up to date on all of the upcoming library through the lens presentations and workshops and if you haven't already registered next tuesday evening we welcome author josephine moon as she talks about her latest warm and uplifting novel about love, family and lots of beautiful food, The Cake Maker's Wish. So I hope you'll join us then. Thank you once again. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Joe. Bye. Thanks, Rob. <laughs>